As of May 9th, 2023, the Oakland Athletics have the worst record in baseball at 8 and 28, and there's not much improvement in sight. On top of the team on the field being a mess, the Oakland Coliseum is falling apart at the seams, infested with animals and continuously being ranked as one of the worst parks in Major League Baseball. The combination of a bad viewing experience and bad baseball are making fans choose to stay home rather than come support their local team. While attendance has never been great for the athletics in Oakland, the baseball used to be really good. In fact, the A's have one of the most storied franchises in not only Major League Baseball, but all of American sports. From names like Ricky Henderson to Mark McGuire, a staggering 14 World Series appearances, a movement that changed how baseball teams rebuild even to this day, and a historic win streak that is still talked about every season. It's hard not to put the A's up with teams like the Yankees and the Patriots as one of the best organizations in American sports history. Unlike these franchises, however, the A's are cast aside and shoved into the void of sports mediocrity, even with their rich history of winning. Because of this, fans are left to question if there is any hope of returning to the winning this team used to do so often since their inception. This winning didn't all happen in Oakland, however. In fact, it started in another historic sports town on the other side of the country. The Philadelphia Athletics were founded in 1882, playing in the American Association until the league dissolved in 1891. The Athletics would return in 1901, however, as a part of the original American League, and they came out of the gates swinging. The franchise would start off its infancy strong, going to five of the first 11 World Series and winning three of those. While they got off to a hot start, their loss in the 1914 World Series would mark the beginning of a decade-long skid for the franchise, one in which they would finish in last place in the American League seven times and finish in the bottom half of the standings a total of ten. This collapse can at least partially be attributed to the formation of the Federal League, a baseball league that drew the eyes of many pro ball players during the time. Of the 286 players that played in the FL, 172 played in the majors prior. While the FL only lasted from 1913 to 1915, the damage was done, and the Athletics would not see success in the American League again for years, specifically in 1929. 1929 began a stretch in which the A's would go to three straight World Series with the help of Hall of Fame players such as Lefty Grove, who won the pitching Triple Crown in both 1930 and 1931, Jimmy Fox, Al Simmons, and Mickey Cochrane. The A's would win two of those World Series with this core before slowly fading back into obscurity, tumbling down the standings a bit more every year. While a collapse like this isn't uncommon after a team has a big run, there were underlying effects in this case. The Great Depression reduced team revenues and forced the team's hand into selling some of their best players. On top of this, a power struggle would ensue between the families who ran the team that would eventually lead to it being sold in 1950. The A's would have a couple years left in Philly, though they weren't pretty. Their best year after the sale of the team was 1952, where they would finish four games above 500 and fourth in the league standings. With the Phillies having the better team with more attention from the city and the A's continuing to bleed money, the team's new owner Arnold Johnson and the A's packed up and moved west to Kansas City. Two exceptions and it gets kind of oh, you can stay, but I'm leaving. Yellow if they're using late season apples. And of course in Canada, the whole thing's flip flop. Sometimes a change of scenery can help a team perform better, but that's not really how it went for the A's in Kansas City. While I'd like to go year by year with how this team did, each year is relatively similar. In their 13 years in Kansas City, the A's never finished higher than 6th in the American League standings, and never finished above 500. While they did have some star power, such as future Cy Young winner Catfish Hunter and Puerto Rican baseball star Vic Power, it was never enough to give Kansas City a decent team. On top of this, Johnson would die shortly after the A's moved to Kansas City, and the new owner, Charlie Finley, was looking to move the team immediately after taking over. Finley didn't like having a team in Kansas City, and Kansas City didn't like Charlie Finley for that reason alone. He was one for the dramatic, even threatening to move the A's to a cow pasture in Peculiar, Missouri, a few miles east of Kansas City while he shopped for the team's relocation. While Kansas City didn't like Finley, they did love baseball, having high total attendance prior to Finley's takeover. The athletics were not significant during their time in Kansas City, but the effect they had on Kansas City itself was significant. This whole experiment proved that Kansas City was a 
major league city, and they were awarded the Royals shortly after the A's left. To this day, Kansas City Athletics gear is still sold around the Kansas City area, becoming a prominent logo used across the city. Like previously mentioned, Finley would try endlessly to get the team out of Kansas City, trying to sign deals that were continually rejected by the American League. There were plenty of cities fielding offers as well. Among those in contention for the team were Louisville, Dallas, Seattle, Milwaukee, and even New Orleans. After the American League rewarded expansion franchises to both Kansas City and Seattle for the 1969 season, the A's were ready for their move. To Oakland. Why Oakland, you might ask? According to Charlie Finley himself, Oakland represents the best opportunity for me and the American League. Whatever that means. I'm going, going, back, back to Cali, Cali. Uh, yeah, I'm going, going, back, back to Cali, Cali. Yo, dog, keep it down. The A's started their time in Oakland well, going 500 in 1968, their first time reaching the spark since 1949. Following this, they would finish both the 1969 and 1970 season in second place, a series of solid results for a team that was floundering at the bottom of the league a few years prior to moving. In 1971, the A's won the AL West, sending them to their first American League Championship Series. Though they would go on to lose this series, the team wasn't done. From 1972 to 1974, not only did the A's go to three straight World Series, they won three straight World Series, something that had never been done by a team not named the New York Yankees. While these teams had some star power, the main attraction was none other than Reggie Jackson, the Hall of Fame bat who hit 86 home runs and had an OPS of 882 during the team's three-year run. It's also hard not to mention Catfish Hunter again, as he was also dominant during this time, leading the league in win percentage in 1972 and 73 and winning the Cy Young Award in 1974. The late Vita Blue was also dominant during this stretch, as he won the MVP in Cy Young in 1971 and had a 2.72 ERA during the A's dominant stretch from 1970 to 1974. In 1975, the A's would once again come in first in the American League, but go on to be swept by the Red Sox in the ALCS. Though they had a solid season in 1976, finishing second in the AL, their loss in 1975 would mark the end of their dominating reign over Major League Baseball. At this point in time, Charlie Finley was still the owner of the A's, and if you couldn't already tell, Finley was an interesting guy to say the least. He prided himself on being a businessman. In an article written by Nick Acacella for ESPN, he describes Finley as a loudmouth, a tyrant, and a miser. He is also a master showman and an innovator. Finley tried to change the game in many ways, doing his best to make baseball games a show that everyone can enjoy. Baseball uniforms became colorful. He threw gadgets into the park like a mechanical rabbit that popped up out of the ground behind home plate when the umpire needed new baseballs. He had a home run porch installed in the outfield in Kansas City. He proposed that players should be free agents every offseason. Finley even installed a zoo into the outfield of Municipal Stadium prior to the A's move. Even with all this, he wasn't the most liked figure in Kansas City and he still wasn't in Oakland. In fact, people started to not go to A's games in Oakland in spite of him, not because they didn't like the team. It was clear to many that Charlie was in this for the money, not the baseball. The horror stories about this man's desire to earn are endless. There were rumors about him shopping the team to Toronto almost immediately after moving to Oakland. The thing about Finley was that he was going to find a way to make money, even if it was at the expense of the fans' enjoyment of the games. But, with the league threatening to sell the team and a looming divorce tying Charlie's hands, he was forced to sell the team. While the A's were about to pack up and move again, this time to Denver, the Raiders moved to LA kept them in Oakland, and the team was sold to Walter A. Haas. With Finley out and the A's left with a young core that was very exciting to watch, ticket sales skyrocketed to 7 digits total on the year following Finley's exit. And it's not far-fetched to say that the fans came to the Oakland Coliseum just to see Ricky Henderson. Ricky wasn't a generational talent, he was THE generational talent. He was a good fielder, great at the plate, and the best to ever do it on the base pads. Ricky prided himself on his base running ability, stealing 100 bases in a season, and then proceeding to do it two more times, all while leading the league in runs five times over his career. Ricky was as confident as you can possibly be, teammates often recounting themselves hearing Ricky tell himself that he was the best. He was a character often referring to himself in the third person and always speaking his mind. 
Ricky was in an A his entire career, hopping from them to the Yankees, Padres, Angels, Mets, Blue Jays, Mariners, Dodgers, and Red Sox with short stints back in Oakland in between. He was there when the team went back to the World Series and won in 1989 and led the team in war the year following in which they won the American League. Ricky would retire in 2003, a Hall of Famer, the career leader in runs and stolen bases, and with an MVP in a World Series ring. After the death of owner Walter Haas, the A's new owners cut team funds. What followed were teams that ranged from mediocre to horrible, which was understandable as the A's needed to put together a team with as little money as possible. Enter Billy Bean, the organization's GM. Bean took over as general manager in 1997 and was tasked with creating a roster that could compete with one of the smallest payrolls in baseball. Bean and his team did this by evaluating their players based on analytics that teams didn't really look at. The Moneyball theory places no emphasis on the body of the athlete or the physical tools that the player possesses. This theory illustrates the simplicity of baseball by asking two questions. Does the player get on base and can he hit? The team used stats that were complex and against the norm, and it worked. While I'll admit that most of these stats are over my head, the ones that I can understand that they used were on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and potential runs scored. From 2000 to 2003, the A's went to the playoffs all four of those seasons, and they also bred talent such as MVPs Miguel Teada and Jason Giambi, as well as Cy Young winner Barry Zito. When teams realized they didn't have to pay star players millions of dollars to win, everything changed. While there are still some teams that use the old style to evaluate and win, teams like the Tampa Bay Rays have found success with Moneyball, building their team with cheap players and making their way to the 2020 World Series. While the Rays might have done it best, the A's did it very, very well. Exhibit A, the 2002 season. When you talk about comebacks, you typically think in the short term. What is often ignored, however, are comebacks over the course of an entire season. The 2002 A's didn't get off to a hot start. They hovered around last place in the AL West for most of May and were playing 500 ball by June and for most of July. If the season had ended around the All-Star break, they would have had an average season at best with a wild card in striking distance. But the baseball season is 162 games for a reason and the A's made their last 81 games count. On August 13th, the A's beat the Blue Jays in a 5-4 clash. Then they won the series and then another and another, and another. The A's went on a tear, the likes of which had never been seen in the American League. 20 games without losing, with the 20th coming in style off the bat of Scott Hatterberg in one of the most electrifying home runs in baseball history. Runners in the American League West, right now three up on the Angels. Swung on, fly ball, deep right field, they've done it again! These were the Moneyball A's that challenged everybody's idea on how to build a baseball team. Their streak would end their next game against the Twins, but their record would live until the 2017 Cleveland Indians would go on to break it. The A's finished the 2002 season a staggering 103-59, tying them for the most wins in the league and giving them the second best record in the AL behind the powerhouse Yankees, who played one less game than them and gave themselves a half game advantage, doing so with an $86 million difference in payroll. The A's would go on to lose the division series in Game 5 to the Minnesota Twins, coming up just short of tying the game in the bottom half of the ninth. While they couldn't finish their magical season the way they liked, the A's electrified the city of Oakland and proved that you didn't need a $100 million payroll to win. Since the inception of Moneyball, the team has continued to tear down and build up teams, making the playoffs as recently as 2020 and continuing to fade in and out of mediocrity every few years. Even prior to the amazing 2002 season, the A's went to and lost the ALDS, as they would do the season after as well. Oakland finds themselves in the playoffs periodically, often in spurts of three years, and often just to lose and return to Oakland and prepare for another rebuild and another chance of winning a World Series. In 2016, the A's became fully under the control of their current owner, John Fisher. Like many owners in Oakland, Fisher is grossly unpopular. Fans have their own presumptions about this man, most of them valid. 
One word can describe Fisher's time owning the A's, absent, both in a metaphorical sense and a physical one. In terms of the metaphorical, Fisher has been called out multiple times for using the A's simply as a way to profit off not spending any money on the team. Thanks to the MLB's profit sharing agreement, the A's and Fisher can spend practically nothing and still continue to earn, essentially de-incentivizing building a good team. Fisher is also just not really around. A report from 2021 states that the first time that many of the A's staff saw him was in 2019, three years after he had taken control of the team. In fact, Fisher doesn't seem to care about being around at all, missing many major events for the franchise. Fisher doesn't talk to the media at all. Most of the information used in this subsection is from an article that had to use sources in Fisher's orbit to get information about this man. Fisher is an enigma. He tried to relocate the A's for years, but doesn't want to do any of the environmental work to make it happen. He goes to A's games in street clothes and watches from the general stands, and he is very very wealthy. And no, he's not the generous kind of wealthy. There's plenty of reports of his mistreatment of minor leaguers, rejecting the idea of giving his prospects $400 a week and feeding school cafeteria level food to high performance athletes post game. While his methods teeter between questionable to workers' rights violations, the A's have had some success with him at the helm, making it to the playoffs in three straight years from 2018 to 2020. The problem now is the majority of that core that was there for those big playoff runs are all gone, being traded, released, or lost in free agency. The years following that three-year stretch are expected. In 2021, the A's were third. In 2022, the A's were fifth, with one of the worst records in the league. And, present day, the A's currently have the worst record in the league. On April 20th, 2023, it was announced that the A's ownership had purchased a piece of land on the Las Vegas Strip to build a new stadium. This will mark the team's third move in less than a century and create another hole in Oakland's sports scene. While this is a sad time for the city of Oakland, it could be a sign of hope for the franchise itself. At the beginning of this video, I posed the question, is there any hope for this team to return to winning? And I really do think that the answer is yes. This team is incredibly young. It has some exciting pieces that are yet to be developed or are hitting very, very well like Brent Rooker. Though it's bittersweet, many of the A's former prospects have been tearing up the league recently and in the past 10 years showing that the A's can still foster talent. Not to mention, the last time the A's moved, they won three straight World Series. In an organization who has such a rich history of building itself up after being cast aside and giving people a reason to root for them, there is no question that the A's are never out of it, wherever they are and whoever is on the field in yellow and green.